You know, at the heart of Christianity, there's a fundamental question that comes about. I'll get it out in a minute. Question, not question, but question that comes out. And, and that question we're going to be asking is, what do you believe about Christ? You see, so many people are still struggling with that question today, and maybe even those who sit in our churches from day to day. We're, we're still struggling with who it is that we believe Christ is and what he does. And, you know, in, in Luke chapter 5, we see that Jesus, uh, there are people asking that question there because he makes a statement to a paralyzed person when he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And then the leaders and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they, they're perplexed by this in verse 21 in Luke chapter 5. And they say, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And then we find uh, those at the table with him that night. And, and, and excuse me, Jesus is there with his uh, disciples on the Sea of Galilee when this great big storm comes up. And then they said, who is this man? that even the wind and waves obey him. And then in Luke chapter 7, verse 49, we see those sitting around the table with him, and they're amazed to hear Jesus uh, as he give, grants a pardon to a prostitute. And they remark, who is this man who even forgives sins? And then in Luke chapter 9, we, we see Herod there, and he's the one who puts John the Baptist to death, and he hears about Jesus, and he says, I beheaded John, who then is this I hear such things about? And he tries to see him, the Bible tells us. Matthew chapter 21, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem uh, on that donkey, uh, that fateful day that he was just before he was betrayed. And it says the entire city of Jerusalem was stirred as he entered. Who is this, they ask? And so the same question this morning we're going to be asking, we're also going to be answering, who is this? Who is this Christ that we're talking about? And so you can look with me in John chapter 8 this morning, if you like, and follow around with us, because Jesus here in this passage, uh, he is going to tell us that he is, I am, the same word that God used uh, for himself in the Old Testament. Now, we understand Jesus in his writings, in his, not in his writings, but in his sayings that were recorded, where Jesus records that he is the way and the truth and the life. We find out that he's the resurrection. He calls himself the door. We find that he's the good shepherd. But here he's going to make a statement that's really going to uh, draw right into who he really is. And so let's consider this morning Jesus' claim to the title, I am. Listen to what it says. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are Samaritan and demon-possessed? I'm not possessed by a demon, Jesus says, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my words, he will never see death. At this, the Jews exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets, yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? And Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one whom, uh, who glorifies me. Uh, Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did it, uh, if I said I did not, I would be a liar uh, like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him. And you've seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. And at this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Just in this passage this morning, as Jesus makes this claim, about being I am, I want us to just look at three things. And, and the first thing is this morning, when Jesus says I am, he's saying he is equal with God. Uh, he's equal with God. Re remember the name I am goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when, when, when God confronts Moses in this burning bush that would not burn up, and God is saying, I want you to lead the Israelites and I want you to go and take them out of the bondage that they're in in Egypt. 
And I want you to lead them to the land that I'm going to promise them. And you can imagine Moses, he's getting near, by this time, about 80 years old. And he's like, who am I that's going to go? Would they even listen to me? And above all that, you're just saying, God said, and who are they going to believe sent me? And, and so what am I supposed to tell them? And so then God tells them in verse 14, I am who I am. This is who what you are to say to the Israelites. I am have sent me to you. And then God went on to say uh, to, to Moses to tell them this. He says, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to, re, 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 excuse me, to be remembered from generation to generation. And, and so the name I am, when you think about it, if you ever see it written, it is the same word Yahweh or Jehovah. If you ever look in your Bibles and you're reading and you see the word Lord in all capital letters, it's that Hebrew word that's being translated Yahweh or Jehovah. So when Jesus says, I am, he is saying what? I am God. I am Yahweh. I am Jehovah. And, 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 and so, so many words, maybe God is saying back from this Exodus passage, uh, you know, he's saying, you know, tell them to God who's always been and always will be uh, said it. Uh, tell them to God that, that, that has all authority over everything and is everlasting and eternal, said it. Tell them to God that did not change and will never change, said it. But just tell them that I said it. And so finally Moses agrees and goes back. And so it is with this statement that Jesus makes is the reason the Jews want to stone him in verse uh, 59 of, of, of this passage in John chapter 8. You know, and so they would think it to be, un, you know, just unthinkable that someone would even say something like that. They knew that he, they had been commanded by God that anyone who, who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. The entire assembly, God says in Leviticus chapter 24, must stone him, whether an alien or native-born. When he blasphemes the name, he must be put to death. And so in their eyes and in their mind, Jesus has made a statement that's blaspheming God. Uh, you know, here's a mere man, they're thinking, that is saying that he is God or he's equal with God or, you know, and, and that cannot be so. But Jesus makes a few statements here later on. After they've decided they want to pick up stones to, to take the Savior's life, you know, he comes back later on and, and early on in John chapter 5, verse 18, he says this. He says, he was even calling God his own father. That was another reason they wanted to kill him, making himself equal with God. And so there's no doubt now that the Jewish leaders know who Jesus is trying to say he is, and, and they won't have anything to do with it. The Bible plainly teaches that Jesus is equal to the Father in every conceivable way, yet he's God in the flesh. That's the reason Jesus then can come back in Philippians chapter 2 as Paul is writing about him in verse 6. And Paul says, concerning him who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. If you look in the original language when you see the word where it's translated grasped or clinged, it, it means something that you've already owned. It's a possession of yours. And so he wasn't trying to grasp at something that wasn't his, but he said he didn't try to even hold on to what he did have, but he let it go for a short time so that he could come and be a redeemer for you and I. You know, he didn't want us to be able to be out there all alone without having no way to the Father. And so he relinquished his period in heaven for a short period of time and his throne. And he says, I'll go down there and I will do whatever is necessary to bring them to you. And so does that make him any less than the Father? No. He's just as much, as much equal to the Father as anything. Because later on we'll find that Jesus makes that statement. And so then... If he was always there, then we also not only remember that he is equal with God, but he is also eternal with God. He's like the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's just always been. It's hard to explain that to some people sometimes when we talk about God speaking the world into existence. Well, where did God come from? Especially little kids are good about asking those kind of questions. He just always has been. And, you know, even as a young Christian, as I came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I still struggle with that question, where did he come from? Where did he come from? 
how did how do I know that he wasn't created because I you know what I'm created I'm a created being and so I had a beginning God had to have a beginning and so sometimes the doubts in my mind would flourish and grow but let me tell you something as you grow and mature as Christians you begin to realize he's just always been and those doubts in him always existing begin to fade away and so here we find Jesus uh, explaining that he has always been eternal and this is the controversy with the Jews Jesus asserts I tell you the truth if anyone keeps my words he will never see death and then look in verse 52 and 53 what they end up saying to him it's just too much for him to handle and he says at this the Jews exclaim now we know that your demon possessed Abraham died and so did the prophets yet you say that if anyone keeps your word he will never taste death are you greater then our father Abraham, he died and so did the prophets. And then they always ask this important question. Who do you think you are? And I can hear the sarcasm and the cynicism in their voice. Who do you think you are? And maybe at some point in your life, someone's, as you try to share your authority in a particular subject or on whatever the case may be, maybe it's when you were rearing your children and there comes a point in their life and you're trying to help them and you're telling them what goes on. I know I've, I experienced it right on, you know, today and it'll probably continue on. But I always get that thing. If they don't come out and say it in so many words, they're trying to assert the question, who do you think you are? You know, we all are almost to the point sometimes where you don't know nothing. Things have changed since you were coming along. You know, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand this. You don't know about what's happening here. Oh, but you do know because you've been there the circumstances may be a little different but the principle behind it is the same and these people are asking Jesus in so many words who do you think you are and Jesus replied your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day he saw it and was glad the Jews became even more perplexed you know the verse 57 says you are not yet 50 years old and and and, and you've seen Abraham you've got to be kidding and then verse 58, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was. But he said before Abraham was born, I am. And this goes right on back to John chapter 1, verse 1, where the scriptures tell us, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, just from the beginning. I am that's what God that's the statement he's making in Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 Paul claims uh, concerning Jesus for in Christ all the fullness of the deity has been made known in bodily form or it lives in bodily form Jesus himself claimed pre-existence with God with absolute clarity he didn't he didn't back down in John chapter 6 verse 38 for I have come down from heaven not to do my will but the will of him who sent me so he lets you know where he came from. In John chapter 8, he says this, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not. Quite simple. So you can do what you want to do here, but it's not a thing you can do there. That's basically what he tells Pilate when he's standing before him as he's getting ready to condemn him. You, you would have any authority whatsoever unless God give it to you. You only got some rain around here. That's all you got. God only gives you what he will let you have. If he didn't want you to have it, you wouldn't take it. In John chapter 10, Jesus makes this statement, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. It, 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 that's cut and dry. You know, people sometimes say, well, I believe in God, but I don't know about this Jesus stuff. You send them to John chapter 10, verse 30. What do you do about this statement? You know, because... Jesus himself asserts that he and God are the same person. During his high priestly prayer, he petitions to follow in John 17, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. You know, he's not talking about what's happening now. And God bless me because I'm getting ready to go to the cross, and God bless me. No, he's not talking about it. He said, God bless me just like you did before the world. we ever created the world when we were there together. Glorify me that way in the, all the creation of everything. And so I've stressed a whole lot about this point of him being 
eternal with God, you know. And, and I just had to, I, have, I wanted to help you understand that because if he didn't exist, then the rest of the Bible means nothing to you. It means nothing to me. If Jesus can't make the claim that I am the follower of one, if I've been eternal from the beginning, then look, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and it means nothing. The, the rest of the Bible means nothing. You don't have to worry about a thing because it was all a lie. But the truth of the matter is that what Jesus claims is real. And if we accept what he says is real, if he is Yahweh, if he is Jehovah God, if he is the great I am, then he's been eternal. And as a result of him being eternal, he'll always be eternal. And since we can trust him in that, then we know we can always follow him and we get to look forward to that time. So then now we can trust in his death and his burial and his resurrection. Because if it wasn't, if he wasn't always eternal, then he's just a man like you or I. He's died, he's gone. It was good that he offered himself on behalf of someone else. But you know what? How many people do you, can you call by name that you know that offered himself as a sacrifice for someone else? And everyone can recall who he was. Most of the time they're forgotten, other than by a select few. And yet you can call out the name of Jesus and people know his story. And they know his story because he's always been eternal and he was equal with God. And so as a result of that, then, if we understand the great I am, Jesus, was equal with God and he was eternal with God, then we must understand that he is also essential with God. You know, I, there, there's some things in life that we find that are essential. You know, I, I believe today, even as much as gas costs, that a car is essential. You need a way to get around, but you don't need a Rolls Royce. You know, shelter is essential. But look, friends, I don't need a mansion and you don't either. You just need something to provide for your needs and be covered and out of the weather and those things like that. Now, what one person's eyes may be a mansion may not be to another. But the thing about it is we just need the basic essentials in life and God always provides our needs. You know, we need bread and water to survive. We can't live without it. We don't need filet mignon. You know, I, I, I don't know the last time I ate one, 20 years ago. I, I, I You know, I can't afford it, so why try to buy it? You see what I'm getting at? But the very basic things in life I know I have to live and need, I get. And so it is with Christ. You know, there's some things in life that are essential. There's some things in life for you that are going to be essential to your salvation. Your salvation is that which is going to bring you beyond this physical life into the eternal life because the scriptures tell us that all of us have a destiny beyond this physical life. We're either going to go to heaven and be with the Father, or we're going to be cast out. Now, when he talks about being cast out, you're going to have to go to the place of torment. You know, the scriptures talk about that place as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, can you, you've ever been so frustrated or angry or hurt or been in so much pain that you just grit your teeth and you just, and that's what it's taught. It's always that way. But yet heaven is never spoken of that way. And Jesus is the only way there. As we're reading in John chapter 11, we find that Jesus says, whoever believes in me, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. We know we're all going to die here on the earth. We've got a physical death that we've got to face. Some of us are looking forward to it because we get to go be with Jesus. Most people that are straining against it are those who are afraid. They don't know what's coming next, and they're worried about what, what's going to happen. But look, if we're in Christ and we've got a true assurity in who we are in Christ Jesus and we're living for him, we've accepted him as Lord and Savior, we, we trust his message of salvation, we can look forward and say, I don't have to be afraid of it. Yeah, you're going to maybe be worried about what's death going to be like. All of us do. But you don't have to say, look, it's just a short period. It's a span like that that gets me to where God is. And I get to see him in all his glory and all his praise. I can just look at him. You know, Peter says in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we looked at Acts chapter 4, verse 11 earlier in our communion devotion. But Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter goes on to tell them, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There's a lot of people out there that do a lot of things that try to get themselves into heaven. We were watching our Sunday school, or we were watching a series of uh, videos in, in our Sunday school lesson in the back. And one of the things we're talking about is a man in, in the Reader's Digest that had recorded, he was 67 years old, and he had donated over 100 pints of blood. 
And when they asked him why he did it, he said, well, when I go to meet St. Peter, and when he asked me uh, what I'd ever done to deserve to be there, I said, well, I gave 100 pints of blood. Here's a man that was basically relying upon his own blood to get him into heaven. And the scriptures tell us that it's only Jesus' blood that's going to get us there. And I want you to know something. No matter who you are or what you've done in life, God can redeem you. He can cleanse you. And too many people try to spend all their life trying to figure out a way to get around uh, how can I get by without this Jesus character in my life. There's no way to do it. You can, you can build all the churches you want. You can throw all the money at it that you want. You can go out and you can feed all the hungry people you want. You can go out there and you can build all the homes you want for Habitat for Humanity. You can give all your money to the Red Cross. You can go out there and volunteer for the Salvation Army. You can do all that you want to do, but without Jesus, you're going to be lost when God calls us all home. And that's just the truth of the matter. And it's hard to sit there and say, you know, he was such a great humanitarian or she was such a great humanitarian and you have to worry about whether that person is lost and dying and in hell at that point. But Daniel don't say it. The scriptures tell us there's no other name that we can be saved by than Jesus Christ. And so I want you to remember that. Jesus goes on to say in John chapter 14, verse 6, he makes an all-inclusive statement when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Without Jesus, we can't get to God. That's just the way it works. Without him being the path or that roadway to God, we'll never find our way there. And no matter who we are. I try to tell people I like to respect other people and their religious views, but I don't have to respect their re religion. You know, there's a lot of people that go all different paths to try to get to God and think they're going to get to heaven. And I respect them as individuals, but I can't embrace their religious views when the scriptures plainly teach there's no other name, there's no other way to get there except through Jesus Christ. And even in the church a lot of time we try to be so pluralistic that we just say, well, you know, they're good people. They're out there doing this, they're doing that. And at least our church don't even do this, you know. And then, and then we're, maybe God's got a plan for them. But we do know what the Bible says. Without Christ, we're condemned. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. We trust in Christ. We love him. We want to be a part of his kingdom. And when we ask that, God accepts us on our faith that we believe who Jesus really is. He's God. We try to make him out to be somebody else sometimes, but he is God. He's just not a created being like you and I. He was God in the flesh to come down here so that we may know him and we may love him and we may get to God through him. And this morning, I hope if nothing else, I've helped you understand if Jesus makes a statement such as I am, he's saying I'm equal, I'm eternal, but I'm also essential. And this morning, maybe somebody has never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, and you're saying, what do I need to do? Who is this Jesus, and what do I need to do with him? Well, we have to turn our life over to him. First of all, as we repent of our sins and we surrender ourselves, say, God, you know, uh, I've done some things that I'm not pleased with. And, you know, what I say you always need to repent from, or well, those things when you're by yourself and you never want nobody to see, then you need to be repenting. That's sin. Not just because nobody's seen it or you'd be embarrassed because it happened. If there's something there that would be a wedge between you and other people or you wouldn't want other people to know about, then you don't want it to be in front of God. Those are the things you need to turn away from. And you need to say, God, take that. Don't let me hurt you with it anymore. Even though I may not hurt other people, I don't want to hurt you with it anymore. And God, help me lead, live a life that would be pleasing to you.